sometimes you may hear me talk about a file signature and a file signature is normally referenced as a hash value. That could be true if I'm surrounding it of the context of hashing. In this case, what we talk about uh, signature analysis or file header signatures, we're referencing the file header component, the first few bytes of a file, right? So uh, the signature is the first few bytes of a file that are generated by the program that creates it. And that is always the same. So kind of similar to what we reference a hash value, right? When we, you know, when we say, oh, we're gonna generate a hash value of you know, your name, a hash value of a particular text, a hash value of an email, of an attachment, of a file, of a picture, of an audio file, of a movie or whatever, a hard drive. When we say, you know, we're generating some sort of hash value, it's kind of similar in, in, that, in that respect, right? That we're creating a signature for that given file, right? Something that can separate it or make it unique, right? Well, the same way, that's why we reference, you know, file header analysis, we also call it signature analysis, right? It's the same concept in that there's something about it that's unique to it that can always reference back to something else. In this case, that something else is the application that created that particular file, right? So we'll, we'll get into it a little more, but this um, signature, this file signature or file header um, is also known as a magic number. So you might see that, like if, uh, for those of you that ever move forward and do certifications, um, like the CFE, for example, even the CFE has a little aspect of it, of uh, digital forensics. And uh, they, you might encounter a question that might reference something uh, in relation to file headers. And you might get something, oh, you know, what is a file header also known as, you know, and is also known as a magic number, right? Because the magic number points back to whatever the application that created that particular file. And I'll show you examples of where that can come in handy. Uh, also, uh, most of the operating systems that we deal with, right, Windows, uh, uh, the Mac OS X, right, you know, Apple, um, as well as Linux, all associate the application's file extension versus the file header. So, so basically, whenever we see like DOCX or we see, you know, PDF or XLSX or whatever, right, that's the file extension. All these operating systems use whatever the file extension is, and it knows to load up that corresponding application, right? So if it sees PDF, it automatically thinks, oh, I'm going to load up Adobe Acrobat or an application that you have on your system that can open up PDFs. Um, if, it, if, it, if it sees like a, a JPEG, right, you know, JPG extension or something like that, it automatically is going to use an application on your system that loads up graphic files, you know, so it knows you know, to, to load up those particular files based on the file extension. But what we're gonna see, and that's what I'm showing you, is we're gonna be able to look at the file header, which are the first few bytes of a file. And the only way to look at the first few bytes of a file is through a hex editor, right? A hexadecimal editor. And I know we mentioned this, um, I, I did anyway, in the beginning of class, um, uh, you know, one of the uh, the questionnaire que you know, questions, but, uh, now we'll be able to see a hex editor in, in action, you know, where we can actually see what the first few bytes are and then cross-reference those first few bytes to determine what application created that particular file. And that comes in handy when we encounter a file that maybe the file extension was removed on purpose. So that way it isn't associated with anything and most users wouldn't, be, wouldn't even be able to open up, you know, these, uh, these files. So if they double click on the file, especially if like in Windows, if you double click on a file, immediately you get a pop-up and then they'll say, you know, this is unrecognized. Uh, what do you wish to do? You know, do you wish to open up a file using, and it give you a list of applications that you have in your system, or it may even give you an option to access the internet to try to determine, you know, uh, what file this is to, to open, right? So it might give you, if you guys ever seen that, that's basically, uh, you know, the operating system trying to determine what, uh, parent application it is because they can't open the file outright. Any questions so far? Okay. Nope. All right, so there are two ways that we can figure out um, how uh, a document or what parent 
application created a particular document. The first way is manually, which I'm going to show you, right? Manually is through a hex, a hex editor. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm saying hex, but it's really a hex decimal editor, right? You want to get very technical, right? So uh, I just want you guys to get, you know, familiar with hex editor, right? So anyway, we'll open up the file in the hex editor and we'll look at the first few bytes of the file and I'll show you exactly, you know, what, what that means in the uh, next few minutes. Uh, the next is through um, automation, through some sort of, you know, forensic toolkit or a third party application, which um, I'll be able to show you that in slides that I've created of forensic toolkits that automatically tells you what type of application it is. And it'll be very obvious what it is because they'll say, look, you know, uh, this file is claiming to be a Word document when in fact it's actually a video. You know, so it'll tell you there's some sort of mis mismatch. And the mismatch is, there's a mismatch between the file header and the file extension. Right? So we'll get into that in the next few slides. Any questions so far? Okay. So this is an example, right? These two are actually the same exact file. And all I did was I made a copy of the file and I changed the extension. So if you see, it says one says movie segment dot AVI, and then the other says, uh, movie segment dot DOCX, right? So basically the operating system sees this as two separate files, right? It says, it, it reads it as a video file, which is an AVI or a docx. And we can see that in terms of type, one says a media file and the other says Microsoft Word. And we see that the size is, the size itself is exactly the same. When I try to open up the file in a Word document. So if so I'm using Word, I double click on movie segment docx. Immediately I get a dialog box that says, the file movie segment cannot be opened because there are problems with the contents. And then if you look at the details, it actually says that the file is corrupt. It cannot be opened. Now the reason is, the file is not corrupt, the file is fine. What it is, is that this file is actually a video file. It's not a docx file. I purposely went in renamed the extension from AVI to docx. So now what happens is Microsoft Word thinks it's the parent of this application, right? It thinks it created this, this application. But when it goes to open up the file, it checks the file header. The file header is different and, you know, than, you know, than what Word uses. Therefore, it doesn't know how to interpret the file. So you get this file is corrupt. There's a, there's a problem with this file. If I were using a hex editor, and you see right here, I have like file header, and I'm using, in this case, I was using a, a tool. There's, there are many different like open source and like free tools available within Windows. One of them is a FlexHex. Anyway, in FlexHex, if I, when I open up this, this file, you see 52, 49, 46, 46, right? You guys see those? Each of these represent a byte, so 52, is a byte represented as hexadecimal. And so for example, 52 represents R. If you see on the right side, the right pane, we see R. That's the letter capital R is represented, 50, is, is represented as 52 in hex editor, right? So in hexadecimal, 52 is represented as R. 49 is represented as I. 46 and 46 is represented as F, right? So. R I F F. That's basically the first few bytes of the file. So remember when um when we're talking about bytes, like bits and bytes, and we said, look, there are eight bits in one byte, and a byte is representative of a character. In this case, that character being R, um, character being I, F F. Right. Each of these are represented uh, uh, basically representing bytes. So if I say the first few bytes, what I mean is R I F F. 6D, those are the first few bytes. If I look at the bytes in hexadecimal, I see 52, 49, 46, 46. What you and I are gonna use to be able to determine what application this, you know, created this particular document or which um, application actually belongs to, we're gonna use the hex, the hexadecimal digits, you know, for that. But it doesn't hurt to look at what was known as the ASCII table, right? The ASCII meaning the, the character set for what these hexadecimal digits represent. So if you, if you read a little past this RIF 
6D AVI list. AVI automatically gives you what extension or what application created this file. So without even looking at, without even having to go and, and, and research the 52496-4646, I can look at, look at the ASCII table, right, which is this little right side, the right pane, the character set. We can look at the text of it and automatically see AVI list. So I would know, oh, you know what? This is a, um, a video file. It's not really a Word document. So then I will go in and change the extension from docx to AVI, and now I'll be able to play this video. Any questions on that so far? Okay. So next I want to show you what it looks like when if we put both of these files in a... Um, in a forensic tool set. In this case, I use one called NCASE. NCASE is a, is a forensic uh, uh, application, uh, and its purpose is to help save doing the manual work, right? This automatically goes through all the files um, on a hard drive, on a thumb drive, or, or even within a person's home directory. And it goes through all the files, and it says, okay, this is what the file extension is. This is the file category how we see it to be. And this is what the file signature actually um, correlates to or belongs to, right? So if you see, it shows the AVI file extension, the category is multimedia, and it's a match, meaning the signature is a match, meaning the file extension and the file header match. That, that's what essentially what this means. So the file extension is AVI, meaning the file type is video, and the file category here, what they mean, uh, another way to say file category in this particular instance of NCASE is the file header. When we go into the, the document, the document shows, and I wrote on purpose, legitimate document. The file type is Word document, the file type is document, it's a match, meaning this is a legitimate Word document. However, keep in mind, remember the, the docx movie segment file that I created here? It says the file extension is docx, but the file type and the file category are not, uh, are blank. So basically, what the signature file is pointing out here is that this docx is really a multimedia file, right? So it's related to some sort of video or audio. So you know right off the bat that it is a mismatch. Right, that this does not match. Any questions on that? This is using another forensic program called Access Data, um, FTK, Forensic Toolkit. And the same thing, I got the same three files listed. And here it actually shows you what the file header is. So for this legitimate document, it's showing the file header as DOC F11. So, so that's showing as a legitimate um, that the file header matches the file extension. With the AVI file, same thing. I have AVI file as a file extension. It shows the file header as 5249 whatever, whatever. And you know that's all good. But we see here that that same movie segment file that I purposely chose to put in a, DO, a docx extension, it's saying it's really a video clip, right? On the file type, it's represented as truly a video clip. And then it shows you that the category that this belongs to is multimedia and that it also acknowledges that this is a file, this is a bad extension, right? That's what bad XT means, right? It's short just for, you know, bad extension. So it's saying, yes, it's a bad extension, meaning the file header does not match the file extension. Now, everyone understands that, that, at least the concept so far? Sorry, I think that is a yes. Not really, Professor. <laughs> okay. Trying. Okay, no, no, no problem. No problem. Yeah, let me go through a few more slides and then, uh, you know, we see where you're at. Oh, no worry. I can review and review 20 times and I will be <laughs> almost the same. I'm sorry, but I'm not really technology, <laughs> but I'm no, trying no. my best. No, no, sure. no problem. No problem. <laughs> so, so let's say we take a JPEG file, right? An actual picture file. If we take a JPEG file and we open it up in a hex editor, 
as soon as we open it up in a hex editor, what we're going to see is FFV8FFEO, or E0, excuse me, E0. So remember I said the first few bytes of the file, right? The first few bytes of a file determine what application created that file or what type of file it is, right? Either or. So if I didn't know the extension of this file was JPEG and it was just like, you know, it was called whatever, but this is actually a picture. If I open it up in a in hex editor and I see FFDAFFE0, I would know immediately, oh, that's a JPEG. Now, I may not know me, I may have to look it up, but I'm, I'll show you how to go about looking that up. But if I go off number to the right pane, in this case, where I see the ASCII character set, and ASCII is just like American Standard, I forgot what it, what it uh, code, in, in, uh, something exchange, let me just, let me get that right, because I always, uh, yeah, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. So all it is, is just a character set. Now, that's, that's what that means, right? It's just a character set of what the hex decimal value is, right? So what I see, if I see this like, what I always call it as Yoya J, J F I F, I know immediately, oh, that's, that's a JPEG, right? It helps me to remember when I see that, that that's a JPEG. But I'll show you how to go about looking for it when we look at, when we see the, uh, the first few bytes of a file. So FF, the eight should immediately trigger, oh, that's a JPEG. And again, it, it's, I don't expect you to immediately get it right now, but when we do the, uh, the, the search to look it up, then you should be able to match the two. The other thing to keep in mind is with JPEGs, JPEGs have what are known as uh, file headers, but also file trailers. So you know where it starts and you know where it ends. And JPEGs end with FFD9. That's the end of a JPEG. You know, and this is important when we talk about embedded files, right? So when, when we have a Word document, for example, and we put pictures inside a Word document. Remember, a Word document starts off with a different file header. But within a hex editor, if we open up that Word document, we should see somewhere in there FFD8. And that should automatically you know, signify that within this Word document, there's a picture inside this Word document. And then we'll know where the end of that picture is by identifying it as FFD9, right? So we'll go through the motions with that and I'll show you exactly what I mean, you know, with that too. Uh, just, uh, just to show you guys, uh, in the, uh, if you open up a PDF, you'll see in the file header, 25, 50, 44, 46. If you look on the right pane, you would actually see that percentage PDF percentage PDF, you actually see that, you know, um, so it, it kind of be very obvious what type of file created that, um, that file that you open up in uh, a hex editor. Now keep in mind, right, if, uh, if you open up a Word document inside a hex editor, obviously you're going to see the file signature of, of Word, but these are instances, though, though you'll, you'll come across instances where you may have a file that you cannot open or a file that says it's a, it's a, deal, it's a docx, or a file that says it's a PDF, or a file that says it's a video, but someone changed it on purpose so that way you're not able to open it. So at the very least, you could be able to look it up yourself and, and figure out, you know what? This is really a PDF. I'm gonna change this you know, the, uh, docx to a PDF and then I'll be able to open up this file. A PDF also has file trailers, right? So it has a beginning, it has an ending. And there are multiple trailers based on the type of versions you may use within PDF. All right, so um, any questions so far? Okay, I'm gonna show you what, it, what this looks like. So, <laughs> you know, just, just bear with me for a minute. Now, where we're gonna go to find out what file signatures are for a given, you know, uh, file, uh, or, you know, or which applications are it, uh, each of these files are related to, we're going to go to uh, a website called, um, actually from Gary Kessler. He's, um, he's, he's one of these practitioners. He's been in the, in the business for a long time. But anyway, he has a, uh, uh, a HTML file of all the file signatures, and he keeps it up to date. So this website, and this is, this is the website, actually, 
you will go to and you just do a search of whatever the um, the file header is you know so I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll, I'll walk you through it so you can see exactly what that is so just to go back as an example we see this uh, 25 with actually let's just go back to, to the JPEG probably be easier this is a JPEG, right? And we see it's FFD8, FFE0, right? So we'll do a search inside the website. I'm gonna do uh, Control F. Control F is to search, where, you know, whenever you're looking at a web page, right? That's normally the, um, the, the sequence. And if I do F8, I'm sorry, FF, I'm literally going to just type in the same thing, FF, D8, FF. Immediately, you guys see, right? It brought me to this. I don't know if you guys, hopefully, um, let's make this a little bigger. Right, you guys can see that, right? So the yes. FF, thank you, the FFD8, FFD0. And then remember I said I was talking about the ASCII table or the character set of what these hexadecimal values mean, right? So if you see FFD8, FF, if you don't know it off the top of your head, that's fine. You go to this website, control F to do a search. And then you type in literally FF space, D8 space, FF, it automatically brings you to what it shows you as these are JPEGs and it tells you right off the bat what it is. So if that's the case, then you know, you know what, I'm going to change, you know, one you need is, is to, to verify and validate that the file is in fact legitimately a JPEG or whatever. Or um, if let's say this file had a different extension or no extension because then you couldn't load it or you have to choose a program to open it up. If you went in with a hex editor, you can easily just change the extension to JPEG, and now you'll be able to open up the file. All right, so a PDF, we see it starts off with uh, 25, 50, 44, and then 46, right? I'm going here to Gary Kessler's, uh, Kessler's website, Control F, and then I type in 25, space 50, Space 44, space 46, right? It brings me to this and it tells me, you know, what are all the possible extensions as well as what it looks like, you know, in uh, the ASCII character set, right? And it tells you exactly that this is Adobe portable document format, a forms document format, as well as illustrated graphics files, right? So this is actually proprietary to Adobe, um, you know, Adobe, uh, the, the Adobe portable format. Right, which is basically what PDF you know stands for. Any questions on this so far? Okay. I'm just showing you here that you know there are other websites you could go to. Gary Kessler is not the only website that you can go to to get this information, but Gary Kessler constantly keeps his website up to date. And other websites may um, may have a lot of uh, like ad like advertisements and stuff, and, and some may even be malicious. So that's why you know I don't like to um, to go to other websites to do something like this. That if if I don't if I'm not able to get it automatically within a forensic toolkit or some sort of forensic application, or if I'm doing this manually on purpose, you know, um, then I would always use Gary Kessler's website. You know to you know, to, to search for my file header information. But I, you know, I just want to show you this slide that there are other websites that are available that will give you this information. So a Word document, if you put a Word document inside a hex editor, you would see 504B0304, right? That's one example, you know, that you would see. So 504B0304 right, inside a Word document. I go to the, again, Gary Kessler's website, control F, and then I type in 504B03, you know, space 03, space 04, 
And now I have a whole bunch of different types of formats, you know. Notice how it says zip, right? But this is actually a Word document also. But you notice I have 0304 space. I may have more, um, more bytes to fill in. So we have here 0304, but then I also have 14... 0, 0, 0, 6, right? We follow down here because this is where this is our mission docx file, right? That that's part of the lab. See 14 0, 0, 0, 06. So this is so 50 is one byte. 4b is second byte. 0, 03 is the third byte. 0, 04 is the fourth byte. So what I have here marked is the first four bytes. But let's go through the first seven bytes. Right? So let's just put that in. The first seven bytes. Putting in the first seven bytes, now we have docx, pptx, xlsx. You know, so anyway, what's interesting is that this might be a little too much for, for this class, but um, the reason uh, it came up as a zip file is because um, the newer formats of Word documents, whenever you see the X, you know, at the end of uh, at the end, it's it's considered the uh, the open XML format, which is really a zip file. It's a compressed file. Uh, if if you decompress the file, the file is actually broken up into into um, like two or three different sections. You know, but that's, that's a little too much. You know, for for this for this class. But the whole point is that, you know, um, it may take more than four bytes to determine what file you're using. Right. In our case, we had to go seven bytes in to determine that this was actually a Word document. Of course, there might be other clues when you look at the, uh, the hex editor that it is a Word document. And I'll show you what that looks like too um, in the hex editor. So you know, when I open up the mission docx file in the hex editor, you're gonna see um, we'll have other ways to determine that it's a Word document. We won't always have to rely on the file header, but the file header is the best way to do this. You know? So my point is, don't always rely on the first four bytes the way I've been doing it. And the reason why I have uh, the docx document in here is to show you that uh, to determine it's a docx, you have to go seven bytes in, you know, in this case. Any questions on that so far? Okay. All right, so this is the word document, right? This is the, um, if you see up here, the, the mission, docx document and it's a picture it has we will take care of our business here and this is actually this is legitimately a picture i took when i went to puerto rico some years ago i've got how many years ago but we'll, we'll see it in the um uh in the metadata at least uh when we got more information about this picture uh you actually see when i took this picture but anyway the bottom line is i took a picture of, of this restaurant, right? Uh, yerba Buena, and not Yerba, you know, smoking Yerba, right? Just, you know, uh, you know, Yerba Buena restaurant in, in Puerto Rico. And I superimposed a text on this image. And that and that text is, we will take care of our business here. So that, that text is actually a, a graphic. It's not text, it's not real text. So if I did a search, for example, of this document, and I searched for the word business, I should not. I should not be able to see. Um, it, it won't. It won't highlight business as being part of this document because it's. Uh, it's an image. It's not text. However, this part of the document is text. Tell Eric to meet us here so Tony can do what he has to. Right? Thanks, bro. Greg, what up? So, for example, I did Control F. Right, that's the search in a document. I'm doing a search for Tony. Tony's highlighted. I do a search for Greg. Greg is highlighted. I do a search for business. Business is not highlighted. I do a search for care. Again, these are just, you know, where, uh, I don't see nothing for, for care, right? So this whole part of the document, meaning the picture and the image and the superimposed graphic of we will take care of our business here are part of the image. They're not is not text, therefore it's not searchable. 
right? The same way, you know, Yeba Buena is not, is not searchable, you know, in this document either because that's part of the image. You guys understand the differences, right, between an image and what's considered text, right? The same way if I just took a picture of this, right? Let's say this whole thing here, right? I just did a screenshot and I said, I'm going to do a screenshot of this. Now I took a screenshot and I'm going to try to open this up. Now I have this as, as an, this is an, an image itself. So I'm going to copy that and bring that into, let's say I'm going to make another Word document, just for argument's sake. I paste it. This is an image. So now I'm doing a search, doing the same thing. I'm doing a search for Greg. It's not, it's not acknowledging Greg. It's not showing, it's not highlighting Greg the way it did on the other one. I'm doing a search for Eric. It's not highlighting Eric as it, you know, Eric does not exist, right? Because this is part of the image. And you can see how, you know, this whole thing is all spaced out, right? That is it's just allowing me to, to manipulate the graphic itself, right? Because it's part of the graphic. Now it's not searchable anymore. Right, so just wanted you guys to understand that concept, right? Between what's considered a graphic and what's considered text, and what in fact can be searchable when we're looking in a, in a document. And these are the issues that you know a lot of uh, forensic examiners go through when um, when they're searching for text, you know, in files, or when they're searching for text through a hard drive, or they're looking through unallocated space or whatever. That you they run into these issues where the pictures themselves are not um, searchable. The text may be searchable, but not the pictures themselves. But being able to recover the picture could lead to clues that are important, right? So if someone just took a picture of this, and this is a picture of the text, then the text would leave me clues as to the players or the, the, the people that are involved in this crime that took place inside this restaurant, right? Because that's where they did their business, right? It would leave me the clues to Eric, Tony, Greg. Right, I got three people already that, you know, that, you know, were part of this, you know, crime that took place inside this restaurant. And maybe I would even know the location of this, right, through, the, through getting the, uh, the metadata, what's known as the metadata of the picture. If the picture was taken and the GPS information, right, we call it like geotagging, right, geotagging of the picture, it might even leave me clues as to where this restaurant is immediately without having to do research. Right, but I'm sure looking up, you know, Yeba Buena restaurant, um, and, you know, you might, I might find the exact location, you know, Puerto Rico where it is, or if there were GPS coordinates within the picture, it would, you know, I could definitely, you know, uh, you know, get that information, you know, by doing that, right? And we are going to do that also, not, not today, but we'll do that in another lab. That's a separate lab that we have in the next couple of weeks that are going to be, that's going to be based on, you know, getting this, uh, getting the geotagging and the metadata from a picture itself. But anyway, I just want to show you guys uh, distinguish the two differences between a graphic and text and which ones you actually could be able to search from. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. So when we're looking at a picture, so now I have the mission docx file that I have, that I've opened up and I opened up the document inside a hex editor. Inside this hex editor, I'm going through it and I see locations. The, on the far left pane here, I have file locations. Uh, actually, locations of, these are areas of the disk itself or the file of, of where the file is stored on disk. And what we're seeing, if we go to the right pane, we're seeing very specific information, metadata of the picture itself. So right now I see Canon PowerShot SD 750. I don't know you guys see that too, obviously, right? So, so the fact that you see this right now, this is the, the make and model of the camera that was used to take this picture. Then you see 2009, uh, 223. That's actually February 23rd, 2009. And then we see 2246. That's actually the time, right? A military time. And this equates to 10, uh, 10 p.m. So it's 10.46 uh, uh, 10 p.m. and 52 seconds that this picture was taken. You know, so right now I, I know the make and model of the camera, the date, uh, the month, the year, 
as well as the time that uh, this picture was taken. And this is just looking through it through a hex editor. And I also get the firmware version of the camera that, that, that took it. The firmware is just software version. You know, uh, guys with, uh, with firmware, um, a lot of uh, uh, electronic components have updates, right? Patches and stuff, right? The same way, you know, our iPhone's constantly getting upgraded or re uh, patched or they're coming up with a, with a different version of things for enhancements and features. Well, so do a lot of these uh, digital cameras too, right? Digital cameras um, also have uh, updates, right? Potentially, you know, they have access to the cloud, right? They have an IP address and access to some sort of storage in the cloud where they're able to copy the photos that are taken from the camera onto the cloud immediately, right? And uh, this is how like a lot of um, folks in the press and when they take pictures of celebrities and you get some of these celebrities that are so angry, right? That, you know, they'll, they'll take cameras and just like throw them to the ground and, and break them or, or whatever. And, and the you know, celebrities think that the pictures haven't been taken or that the pictures have been destroyed, right? That's old school. Now, when these photographers take pictures, those things are immediately getting uploaded to the cloud immediately, right? And this is true with not only pictures, but also with videos, right? These videos and, and, and pictures are immediately getting taken and copied onto the cloud, right? So they may have an SD RAM card or like a memory card on the cameras, but what a lot of today's cameras do is they copy both, right? Once they, it gets copied on the, on, the, on the memory card and then it, it gets uploaded to, uh, to the cloud somewhere, right? Somewhere on the internet uh, for storage, right? That's in the event that the camera do get, does get destroyed or something like that happens where you have celebrity, you know, or if cameras get stolen or whatever, um, that's part of it too. Yeah, let me show you guys that. Okay. Uh, uh, another step is, yeah, we can go this uh, fairly quickly. I just want to show you guys that, you know, um, there are ways to be able to extract the picture. In, uh, if, it's a, if it's a Word document, for example, and you just want to extract the picture itself to get what the hash value is. And I think we spoke about this before in relation to legal authority. And, um, you know, when pictures are, are taken, um, and, and these pictures are going to be used for a court of law. Uh, hash values are used to uh, determine, you know, like, um, you know, not only file integrity, but also that the file wasn't manipulated in any way, right? Um, the file wasn't tampered with. And so when we do a hash value of a picture, when we do a hash value of a file, when we do a hash value of a hard drive or whatever, the reason we're, we're really doing that is to determine or to prove to the courts that these files were not tampered with in any way whatsoever. That when we acquired the hard drive or when we acquired the picture or when we acquired you know, the video or whatever, that the very first thing we did in preserving the chain of custody and everything else was... Uh, do a pre-forensic hash. We took a hash value of, of that particular file. Then once we did the hash, once we did that, we made a copy of it, a forensic copy, right? A bit by bit copy. And by making that copy, then we took a post-forensic hash, right? A hash value. Now we compared the pre-forensic hash and the post-forensic hash, and we see that the hash values match. Therefore, they weren't tampered with on our end. However, Let's say someone did this incorrectly, that they didn't do it with uh, having it, you know, to be submitted in a court of law as evidence. They weren't thinking that when they were doing this. And what someone did was they took a file, you know, let's say they took that same, the same file here, instead of copying out this image um, by itself, extracting the image, uh, in regards to where, where it starts and where it ends. And we know that these files, in terms of a JPEG image, starts with um, FFD8, and it ends, and when we look at it in hex, and it ends in FFD9, right? And just in case, we had that in, when we're looking at it in the JPEG, right? Let me just go back to that very quickly to show you guys.
Okay. So JPEG, right? JPEG starts with FFD8 and it ends with FFD9. So the beauty about this is I can open up this document in the hex editor, extract from whenever I see FFD8 to FFD9, extract only that portion. Extract it, rename it as a JPEG, and now get the, uh, get the hash value of that file. Now I've proven that this is legitimately the hash value of the file as it is within this document. But let's say I don't do that, right? Because I don't know the I don't know how uh, I'm not a I'm not a forensic expert. I'm not a digital forensics expert. So all I do is this: I literally take this word document, I take a screenshot of this picture, then I open up the picture in my um, in my graphics program. I copied it from the clipboard. And let's say, um, let's say I have to save this as something, you know, let's say I save it. I'm just going to leave it at that. Untitled, you know, PNG. So untitled PNG, I'm going to open up. I'm going to use one of my um, tools. I think we used iHash the last time. Change that to file, MD5. And let me just drag and drop that PNG file onto this. And now I have, let me just blow this up so I can see, so you guys can see this. Now I have as the hash value, this. And then I now submit this as evidence in court to say, you know what? This is the hash value of this picture. This is where they did this. These are the guys, these are the guys that are involved. And you know, this is, you know, this is it. So I want to submit this as evidence. But this isn't the right hash value. This is the incorrect hash value because one, how it was saved, it was saved as a PNG file. It's a different graphic. This is really a JPEG file, not a PNG file. So anyway, the defense attorney is smart. They hire a forensic expert, digital forensics expert, to help with this with this case. And the digital forensic expert actually extracts this properly. Extract it to the point where this is actually a JPEG file. And a JPEG file produces a different, is going to produce a different uh, hash, uh, hash value. So now, as the defense submits this, this piece of evidence now gets thrown out. So now the prosecution cannot use this um, key evidence as proof of maybe where the, um, you know, where, where this, uh, you know, uh, took place, where this crime took place. Or maybe what's associated with this picture can't be used either, right? It could even mean throwing out the entire document. You know, now we don't even know the players that are involved, right? The Eric, Tony, and Greg, you know, whoever else, you know, you know, you know was, in, was mentioned in that document, right? All that can possibly, you know, be thrown out. So now that can't be used. They gotta, they gotta use something else to, to introduce into court as, as evidence. Any questions on that so far? No. Okay, cool. Nope. So anyway, yeah, so I, I just, uh, I just, I just show you guys just in the way of doing this inside word, you know, I, I, I explained to you the manual way of doing it, but inside oh, word, you can easily, Sorry. yes. Uh, the recording is going to be um, posted. Yes. Yes, it will. Because technically I said no, but yes, but I feel like it's a lot. So I'd rather just watch the recording again. No, no, not a problem. Not a problem. But you know, that's the manual way of doing it, but uh, an automatic way of doing this. And you guys can practice this for, you know, for those of you that, that, that are opening up this document and, and are going through this exercise. If you just open up the document and then you did file save as, and you saved it as a web page. You see down here, I have those little stars, right? If you saved it as a web page, what it, what it does is it automatically isolates the objects from the, the, the Word document itself. So inside the Word document, what it's going to do is it's going to extract the images that are in it. In this case, the name is going to just automatically assign a name as image0001.jpg. And 
now we can get the hash value of, of that particular file. So if we looked at that file that, that was extracted, we can see some metadata associated with that file, right? So remember how I was saying, you see the JPEG, you see the make, the model, and the camera that was taken, the date that this picture was taken also, right? It goes back to what we saw in, in the hex editor, right? 2009, February 23rd, 10.46 p.m. Uh, this is information about the camera and uh, the model ID of the camera itself, as well as a uh, unique ID that the camera produced of this particular image, right? So, so that's one, one example of it. This is the original image that I embedded in that document. The name is going to be slightly different, but we can see that although I took I took it at two thousand I took the picture in two thousand nine, I actually copied this file in that document in twenty twelve, right? So I'm just showing you the difference between what I get from the original file that I actually embedded inside the word document versus what's actually extracted, you know, from that. And you see, same exact information. Only thing that's different is the name, the name of the file. It, it wasn't able to preserve the name of the actual JPEG file that I gave it, but it preserved all the other information. It preserved the file modification date of when I actually copied it into the document, and it also preserved the original uh, date and, and file time of when this picture was taken. And the image unique ID is also the same, right? Meaning. Uh, it's attributing that image with this, or it's associating that image with this particular camera. If I was to copy the original file, the JPEG file, with the image that was extracted from that Word document, you'll see, and this is hash my files, right? We used that utility, I think, a couple of weeks ago. If I drag and drop the files, you see this little pink showing it's a match, right? And they, they both start with that 6B31 and N in C2, C5. So it was a match, right? So same exact file. This, if I submitted this in court as evidence, look, this is the original file that, that was taken or that was embedded inside this Word document. Now there's no, you know, um, refuting, you know, this piece of evidence, right? So now they can't, you know, if the defense attorney hired a digital forensic expert, they can see, oh, you know what? You know, this is legit. This actually came from that file, right? There's no way of, of being able to just, you know, to throw this piece of evidence out. Okay, so we actually went over, that's actually going over the entire lab, you know, you know going over this, but, you know, just, just to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page here. The, um, let me open up the lab two. So I give you what the purpose of the lab is, exactly what, what we already discussed. The background, just a rehashing of what we went over, right? So in case you, you know, you did forget the lesson and then you didn't want to review, you know, the video in that sense. What applications you would need, a hex editor, uh, the website, which I'll show you how to go about doing that. We already went to Gary Kless's website, which was the, uh, how we did the searches for the file headers. But what I want to show you was, and we did um, hash my files also too. Uh, another option you guys have if you didn't want to use iHash, uh, there's another file called another app within um, the Mac called FilePeak, which, uh, which is similar to iHash, but it also gives you a hex editor, right? So let me just, I want to show you both versions. So this is a hex editor. This is going to the website, by the way. This is that website, hex.it. So this is independent of your operating system, but using Windows or Mac, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna open up a file, and the file I'm gonna open, I'll just do a search for that mission. So this is how you guys are gonna do it, right? You're gonna open up the file, you wanna, you wanna figure out what the file header is. This is my mission.x file, I'm gonna open it up. See, it shows as the mission.x file opened, and you see this, five zero. 4B0304. You guys can see that, right? I wanna. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Maybe now it'd be easy to see. So 504B0304. Let me just. Uh...
We go to file signatures up on top. Let's do this one more time. Remember, control F, 504 B, 0304. And it's basically the same exact thing that you know we went through before, right? 04, 014, 0006. Is this, this one right here. And it goes back to DOCX, right? Again, just proof to show you that opening up in hex editor that this does in fact you know work exactly the same way. If we scroll to the ASCII part, right, this right side. If I did a search for um, FFV8, remember the start of, of the J, remember the, the graphic file, right? JPEG, right? Again, it's, it, this actually gives it the name, that image, remember that image one.jpg file? It actually, you can see what file it's calling, meaning inside Word, it's actually labeled the name. But for that particular file, if you were to extract it. Look at this, the Canon PowerShot SD750, right? We get that metadata. We get that 2009, uh, February 23rd, right? 10.46 PM, right? We get the same information, you know? So what I showed you in the slides in the slides is exactly what I just did right now using the hex editor, using this hex editor. Uh, if you're using a Mac, you do the same exact thing. You can use this program called FilePeak. And let me just get, show you how to do that. Let me just open up that mission docx file. I'm gonna drag and drop that Word document onto this. Now the cool thing about this file peak program, it actually gives you what the hash value is of the file, of the file itself. So that's kind of cool. I've got MD5, uh, SHA-1 and SHA-256 values of it. Uh, you see what users attributed to this, what group, when it was created, when it was modified. And I can even modify, I can change my, my date timestamps on this if I wanted to. But anyway, what I wanted to show you was the hex editor. Inside the hex editor, look at this here. Let me see, make, make it blow this up a little bit. Let me make this bigger. Hmm. All right, I cannot make this, oh, maybe here. Yeah. Oh, that's just a find. All right, I can't make this bigger, but uh, for some reason I can't make the screen bigger on this one. But um, I know it's hard to see, but it does start with the same thing. We see the, the, the file header, 504B0304-1400. Same exact thing. And if I was to do a search for that FFD8, as an example, well, actually, I've got to change the hex. FFD8, it'll lead me to that same exact location. And I see Canon PowerShot SD750. Right, so essentially this is exactly all you need. Uh, exactly what we went through in the slide deck and exactly what I just showed you in Hex Editor to open up you know, any document, a Word document or something else, right? So, and we see the PDF file, this one's called, you know, some ransomware PDF files, one of these, um, you know, how to, uh, how to combat ransomware. And look, without knowing anything, right? I can look to the right here and I see percent sign PDF. That's my clue that this is a PDF document. But if I wasn't too sure, on the left side, I see 25, 50, 44, 46, right? you know, same, same type of thing here, right? I see all this stuff. I'm going to my file signatures, control F, and I do a search for 25, 50, 44, 46. And look, exactly the same thing, right? Leads me to PDFs. So it's literally that simple. 